Hi, everybody. Welcome. People are always wondering how do I. Hope everybody is uh, recovered from their big weekend. I just got back, so it's great to see everyone's faces. Can you guys hear me okay? Excellent. I'm looking for my co pilot. Let's see. Well, I may be doing this solo again. Um, it'll be the second time in a row. Um, that's always fun, but I'll do the best I can. Appreciate everybody being here. Color still. Thank you, Janet. Good thing I did like 45 Zooms in 2021. <laughs> each one feels like a brand new one doesn't it <laughs> always yeah well i uh, i'm sure people keep logging in but we're going to go ahead and get started thanks for joining um i'm sorry our name keeps changing but this is such a an amorphous project um the national women's equality and bleeding disorders care coalition i'm sure it will change again before we get a, a permanent name but um, I appreciate everybody for being here and want to remind everybody that our mission is to form a coalition to secure diagnosis, treatment, and access to medication for women and their family members that have bleeding disorders. Now, um, the Blood Brothers are the impetus for this. Uh, as we all know, the women have been struggling, uh, but they kind of were aware of that. And once they became aware of it, they uh, asked if they could be helpful, and so we got together and had some conversations and learned that the Blood Brothers have some phenomenal tactics that uh, on the women's side we hadn't thought of. So we're organizing, um, we're inviting our Blood Brothers, and we're going to be using previously, previously utilized tactics to get this mission accomplished. Some of our um, progress that we have had so far is um, we have formed a, um, a business plan so that this can move forward with um, some structure. And we appreciate everybody's patience as we have been forming this. It's been, it's one month old, it's a baby. Mm -hmm. um, we will be developing working groups. We're going to have a healthcare policy advocacy working group, a data working group, a science and technology working group, and a communication working group. So if anybody thinks that they might want to join those, um, feel free. Uh, they're certainly not formed yet, but they will be in the near future. And um, I also want to let you know some of our early joiners probably hopping in here right now. We have uh, Believe Limited and Patrick James Lynch. Hi, Patrick. Thank you. Um, we've got Inspiration and Janet Brewer. Hi, Janet. Uh, we've got the Latino Hemophilia Foundation and Rocio Nunez. Rocio, are you on here? Okay, not yet. Um, and we have Biomatrix and John Martinez. And, and um, just to name a few of the early joiners. So we appreciate everybody and hope that we will have more people uh, joining soon. So let's see, it's 934. Um, I guess we can actually go ahead and start the presentation and those that join will just be able to jump in. Um, I am thrilled to introduce, let's see, that didn't work. I'm the speaker, <laughs> but I don't see me speaking. That's funny. Do you guys, am I highlighted? Someone yes, let me know. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, so I want, I'm super happy to introduce to you uh, Amber Federizzo, who is the clinical nurse educator for Octopharma. Amber has been working with the Female Factor and the Hemophilia Foundation of Northern California since the early beginnings. And we have been having this conversation about uh, the lack of treatment and diagnosis that's available for women. So uh, she is a warrior in this fight for us. and. Uh, Octopharma has been supportive of this effort and uh, our efforts at the Female Factor Retreat and the Hemophilia Foundation of Northern California for years. So we appreciate them very much. And um, I'd like to hand this over to Amber, who's going to share some very enlightening information with us. 
Amber? Thanks, Ashley. It's it's an honor to be here and it's, it's so great to see so many wonderful, very familiar faces that I've seen over the years. And today I've been asked to speak more on um, the APEC program, as well as uh, some a VIP study that is uh, in regards to women. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to the shared screen and I'll start with the APEC presentation. All right, um, so for many of you who are aware and some of you who may not be, Octopharma provides an eight check program. And the eight check program essentially is genetic testing that is available to determine your, your factor mutation that is resulting in hemophilia A. As we know from the SIPIT study, the impact of therapeutic product type on inhibitor development risk um, is there for individuals with low risk mutations, mutations we regard as non-null mutations. The, the, in the SIPIT study, there was no patients with non-null mutations that were treated with plasma derived factor eight that went on to develop inhibitor. And this was compared with 30% of those treated with hamster cell line derived recombinant factor eight products. In the NuproTech study, which was a study by Octopharma in previously untreated uh, patients uh, followed on New Week, no patients with non-null mutations treated with New Week developed inhibitors, and New Week, is, of course, is a human cell line derived recombinant factor eight. For individuals with intermediate or high risk factor eight or null mutations, in the SIPID study, we did see that 31% of patients with non-null mutations treated with plasma derived factor eight developed inhibitors compared with 40% of those treated with hamster cell line derived factor eight. So we did see some differences between non-null and null mutations. In the new protect study, 30% cumulative incidence. So these are all inhibitors uh, of patients with non-null mutations treated with new weak developed inhibitors. And this is a comparison between CIPIT and the new protect studies. Of course, one of the limitations of the CIPIT study was that it has been completed so long ago that many of the products that are now on the market that are human cell line as well were not included. Um, but as you can see in the null factor eight mutation in the CIPIT study, all inhibitors, high titer inhibitors were higher at 30 in the recombinant factor eight hamster cell line derived as opposed to 22 person in there for the plasma derived factor eight von Willebrand. And as opposed to uh, non-null mutations, which are not as problematic in terms of inhibitor development, recombinant uh, factor eight hamster cell lines still had an incidence, whereas plasma derived factor eight and von Willebrand did not have incidence in the SIPIT study. In the new PROTECT study, um, which was completed by Octopharma, in the null factor eight mutations, we still see an all come inhibitors of low titer, um, inclusive of high titer of 30 and eight and 18.9%, which is more along the lines of SIPIT in the plasma drive von Willebrand category in 18.9, but still very, um, still very low. Uh, and in the new protect non-null factor eight mutation, of course, there was no, no mutation, no inhibitors found in that group. So the HEC gene mutation analysis service is a free analysis service provided by Octopharma. It is for all patients with hemophilia A who have not had previous genetic tested and selected known or potential genetic carriers. It is currently conducted by Bloodworks Northwest in Seattle. Um, Currently, the criteria have recently been updated for eligible patients. Eligible patients included hemophilia A patients, male or female, with factor eight less than 40, less than 40 percent, excuse me, in patients with a family history of hemophilia. Von Willebrand must be ruled out if there is not known, um, just to make sure that we're looking at hemophilia. Females with factor eight greater than or equal to 40% who are the daughter or mother of a male with hemophilia A where the familial factor eight variant is known and can be provided for use in testing. Females with factor eight greater than or equal to 40% who have a brother 
full or half with the same mother with hemophilia A where the familial variant is known and can be provided for use in testing. Uh, there are some inel ineligible patients, any male with a factor eight activity of greater than or equal to 40%, a female relative with factor eight greater than or equal to 40% who is related in a second degree or more distant relationship to a male with hemophilia A or where the familial variant is unknown and patients or known are potentially affected relatives with a bleeding disorder other than hemophilia A. For the testing approach in blood works, if the familial genetic variant is known, they can confirm or exclude variant in the sample provided. So it is easier to take pieces of, of gene, genes when you know the foundational genetic material. If the familial variant is unknown, there is an algorithmic process that is followed. And first, there is a screen for intron 1 and intron 22 inversions in patients with severe hemophilia and in those reported in the moderate range. So to kind of provide backup and provide some background on null and non-null mutations, null mutations generally are those with large deletions resulting in the inability of the body to create any factor eight whatsoever at all. Those are more prone for inhibitor development, whereas non-null mutations do still have some functional activity in the background. Some of these patients in the non-null group, very small group, could still have severe, severe hemophilia, but it is less likely as the null mutation group. So we do know between these groups, which one is more likely to go on to an inhibitor and can be impactful in determining therapeutic options down the line. So in, in the most common of these, in the screening of the familiar variants is intron 1 and intron 22. And that's why in this algorithm, intron 1 and intron 22 is where the starting piece is. Because of course, if you can find these genetic mutations earlier on in the genetic sequencing, it is easier to find them. If inversion screening is negative, then you go on to sequencing the coding region and the intron exon boundaries and areas upstream and downstream of the coding region. And if sequencing is still negative at that point, you can go into multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification, which is just a lot of these are big fancy words for we're going further and further into the DNA analysis to determine where amongst the exon sequencing and where you're at in terms of the inversions that we can find. If variant is found, which is 97% of samples it is, it is confirmed on a second aliqua of genomic dating um, DNA. Sometimes in, in uh, 90, we can always say 99.9% .9 of the time we find sequencing, but there is still that small chance. So there's cross verification that the, gene, the DNA sample we are seeing is correct. You will see in the reports, the interpreting results genetic variant mechanism, you will see whether it's a substitution, insertion, deletion, duplication, or inversion. And these are just examples of some of the genetic mutations that can occur. The interpreting results of the genetic variant type of missense, nonsense, frame shift, splice site change, and structural change, all of these specific genetic variant types are not going to be known by Octopharma. They will only be known between um, Bloodworks and uh, uh, the patient individually. Octopharma will only receive whether or not it was a null or non-null mutation, and that way it provides an, a level of confidentiality in the background. But many patients are just becoming aware that there are different and genetics within hemophilia A. We used to believe that you know, we coded everyone within severe or moderate or mild, and we put these expectations upon each of those by their, by their percentages that we were looking at. But now we are moving towards understanding a little bit more of the variations in the genetic phenotypes that result within severe, moderate, and mild hemophilia. As I said before, much of what we do in genetic testing tends to be on the, on the cutting edge of you know, where is the certainty of where this is pathogenic or benign. And there are some mutations of which may fall in a kind of neutral realm. It doesn't happen very often in hemophilia, but it does happen um, sometimes across many disorders. And so depending on the computational and predictive data that is already available, EA had and the CDC through CHAMP8 and through other mechanisms have already mapped a huge number of hemophilia 8 mutations and can cross-reference those of which have gone on to develop inhibitors from those who have not. So if you're ever um, really bored at night and you want to look at uh, CDC genetic mutation and Excel spreadsheets, you can go on to the CDC website and see some of those comparative analysis um, there as well. 
Again, the null versus the non-null variant. So it's important that you recognize and identify within your family whether or not you have a null versus non-null variant. Null variants, again, as I said earlier, result in no factor eight protein expression. The classification obviously may be obvious. These are vast majority are severe hemophilia A patients. Whole gene deletion is a null variant. That is a situation where you do not have the DNA to even be able to express the protein, and those are more at risk to develop inhibitors. Missense variants previously reported in mild hemophilia are more common and are more on the non-null variant. And the SIPIT study uh, used the genetic variant type, and they looked at factory antigen measurements to cross-verify whether their mutations were resulting in the phenotype that they were seeing. Bloodworks Northwest Lab will not have factor VIII antigen testing and may not be able to determine null versus non-null status for all variants. As I explained earlier, there is a very small percentage of the genes, which not that they are not there, but our ability to identify and find them may be limited by the current uh, methods that we have available to determine these mutations. So the HEC program is the mutational analysis carried out by Bloodworks, as I said um, earlier, and it provides the knowledge of the underlying mutation, which may help to inform treatment decisions. As we discussed earlier, we now know non-null mutations and null mutations have differences in how they go on to develop inhibitors and how treatment may be need to focus on that risk as it moves forward. So the primary way to do this is uh, to go through any of the HDCs or hematologists who can order this test through Octopharma and have it sent. There is a discussion and a, a parent caregiver proceed with request and completion of the check forms. It is a very small sample, just one lavender tube. The tubes are labeled, they are sent off on CoolPack. Uh, all of the molecular identification permission for genetic testing forms are included, um, as well as if you know the information for your family, it's very important for your son's information or any other information you have on the mutations to be included. And the reports generally are resulted within two to four weeks from being sent off. And again, the results from the eight check program may help to predict whether an individual in your care is at high or low risk of developing inhibitors. Uh, the information you choose to have, um, the information may enable you to choose a factor eight treatment that is best suited to your patients. And we do have a general all stop email for questions that do arise out of the eight check program called eight check USA at octopharma.com. But anytime you can reach out as a medical information request or reach out through any of the patents, um, any avenue to get more information is, is absolutely available. And we can provide additional education around this topic because I know some of these are a little bit, um, we can go more in depth. I could talk about genetics probably all day, but we have limited time. So I will stop there. This is a result sheet that you will see as your report that comes back to you. This is not this does not come back to Octopharma. This will only come back to you. You will see which mutation you have as well as it's been classified as null, non-null, or they were not able to determine, and then whether or not this mutation has been seen in the EHAD database. So I will stop there and just take some questions because I know that that's a pretty high overview. And I know we kind of wanted to keep this um, limited to about 30 for both presentations. So I'll stop there and see if anyone has any questions. All right. And if you uh, do, oh, go ahead. I, I, I've got some questions. I was writing them down as you were. Okay. Talking. Sorry. So um, I saw that you had all of the different variants of the genetics that are um, known so far. Is that correct? Correct. Does this cross over this information with the My Life, Our Future study? And if so, how can that be helpful for um, our goal here to help women get diagnosis and access to treatment? Correct. So all of the registries that are currently available, both nationally and internationally, are cumulatively cross-referenced. So if we don't find a mutation in the U.S. databases, we tend to look at global databases. And all of that information cumulatively is used in terms 
terms of how do we how do we design clinical trials moving forward? How do we get patients um, together to say perhaps we need to do more studies within these individual mutations and take a look at how that might present itself differently, and that may advise us as to how we approach things differently in terms of in terms of women. It can really help identify within their own family their expectations of what they may encounter for. Care, caring for a child with severe hemophilia, or even as we progress potentially in the future, there's that theoretical knowledge that we would know and be able to identify within more mild mutations, how they may actually behave over time. Will they be more detrimental or less detr detrimental than we expect, as opposed to a more global aspect of approaching everyone on a percentage-based approach? And I mean, that kind of folds into my next question is, is this information, and if so, how is this information being made available to our esteemed treaters so that they can uh, begin to utilize this as the science for which they are treating their patients? So Bloodworks Northwest, um, they were part, they were the, the site for My Life or Future as well. And so as all of this data is combined, they partner with CDC and then at a national level, all of this data will be pulled up, it, but it takes it does take time um, and time isn't always something we're good at waiting for. And so I wish I could tell you, you know, there's a timeline of, you know, a pipeline for genetics that I could tell you in five years time, we will be able to communicate up this information to providers. The reality is, is the aggregation stage of pulling all of these mutations together is just being able to identify them. So I would say we're still kind of in the the infancy stage of cumulatively pulling all of these genetics together to understand what it is that we have. And then the next step will be, what does it mean? So right now it would be more of gathering this data, collecting it and making it available to providers who may on their own trigger an investigator initiated trial to say, this is what I'm seeing in my center within these mutations. I wonder what else we can do and come together to explore that further. So there are many different possibilities that can come from this. Um, it's just going to take time, but I would say that this is more in the gathering the data based on the information we know about non-null mutations versus null mutations and their risk to move on with inhibitor development. So fascinating and essential to a lot of the people like myself who are seeking care and have one of these odd uh, genetic mutations and um, are, are, are unable to access care. And um, the only reason I say that is because it's not my story. It's not unique. It's a lot of the women's story in our community. Does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, um, let's see. So we've got, oh, sorry. See, this is what happens when you lose your co-pilots and uh, you're running your own meeting. So we've got, um, Steve says, is Bloodworks Northwest affiliated with Athen? Yes, they are. Okay, and then um, it looks like Randy also answered that question. Uh, and to Earth add on to that, this can be separate from the community counts registry. So in patients who would like to opt out or opt into that pathway, this could be separate. I just want to put it in there that it's not, you don't have to opt into the registry to be participating in this project. Okay, yeah, and that's a really good point. I mean, people need to have informed consent. Um, Randy, you mentioned the Community Counts Program. Do you want to elaborate on that a tiny bit? Yeah, so the Community Counts is what we start off with was, was the, the Uniform Data Collection or UDC and uh, with the CDC back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and it's the closest thing the United States has to a, a, a registry. Um, so I was just uh, trying to explain how Bloodworks Northwest is connected with Athen, and I didn't do a very good job there. So Community Counts is a program that is funded by, like Amber said, it's funded by the CDC, and, uh, and Athen is the, is the uh, place where the database is held, and, and then that data is uh, provided back to the patients and the um, the caregivers, the HTCs primarily uh, for clinical follow-up. This, this other thing that Amber's talking about is a separate but equal uh, component to
data collection in the US. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, let's see. So uh, Janet says many women are not seen at an HTC. How can they participate in this H check? So going through any of the healthcare provider that you have, they can request this from Optifarma and we can send it out to um, their hematologist. So even your private physician? Correct. It would just be a, um, a request to us to send the shipper and the information um, so it could be sent on and analyzed. Um, and I know you guys had a email address, but um, if you were going to present this to your physician who has no clue, what would you show them? What would you bring them to say, hey, I'd like to do this. This is important to me. Uh, one of the easiest pathways is that we're more than happy to um, make that connection and make that presentation so that the provider themselves understand what it is that you're you're asking because for some providers this may be a new aspect and they may not understand fully the reasons behind knowing which is important for them to know as well the risks between non-null and null mutations as well so it can be a cross variant educational experience for both sides um, so either way a check does have a a website but um i do understand sometimes the clinicians may not um, ende endeavor to go on the website. So we're, uh, we're definitely available to connect with those providers and, and educate them on what this looks like as well. That's great. Um, let's see. So Dawn um, Rodolini, thank you for mentioning that. She says it would be really great if people would opt into this so that we can get the information so that we can move all of this along. That's why we're all here. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Dawn. And then... Um, Carolyn says, uh, thank you, Amber, for your years of constant support. I could not echo that more. How about if we don't have any other questions, we move on to the next presentation. Sounds great. Let me move into the VIP study. Sorry, a little bit of delay on my side. Okay. So Ashley did reach out to see and understand um, what studies that manufacturers may be um, doing that are specific to women or women with bleeding disorders. And one of the, the most amazing studies that I have seen in women in some time, and this has um, been going on into the infancy stages, I was involved in some of the development for this program. To, so to see where it is today has been an amazing journey. And the VIP studies um, are just short for von Willebrand factor in pregnancy. And it's a way to understand what is going on with von Willebrand during pregnancy. Jill Johnson of Bloodworks Northwest leads us up as the uh, principal investigator of this study. And as we know, decreased von Willebrand increases risk of pathologic bleeding, low von Willebrand and von Willebrand disease. So those with low von Willebrand in that category, as well as those with um, more significantly decreased von Willebrand, we all know increases the risk of bleeding. A third of the variation that we see in von Willebrand is due to acquired non-heritable factors. Uh, so I always like to give the example of, you know, in the old days when we were running away from uh, animals and tigers and things, our body gets stressed out and it increased our levels of von Willebrand because it knew that we were not gonna be able to outrun the tiger. We would end up bleeding. How do you stop that bleeding? The body's stress releases every available storage of von Willebrand to be able to stop that bleeding. But there are other things that are not as big as tigers like, hormone status, stress, disease, and inflammation. As we age, the increase goes up because the ability for your body to repair is less. Um, even the time of day, so we have diurnal variations within our body, which affects when our von Willebrand is available. Our von Willebrand and our body is always constantly trying to determine when we are most at risk to hurt ourselves and when we may be at most at risk for bleeding. So sometimes patients will have lower levels when they are sleeping because they don't need them. Hopefully nobody will go on to sleepwalk. That could be a problem, but um, oftentimes it's environment. And then two thirds of it is actually genetic. So the genetic, your genetic mutation will also limit how much von Willebrand that your body can actually make. 
pregnancy is a major modifier for vulnerable brand level increases. So again, the body is incredibly smart and it does know that once you deliver your baby, you are going to bleed substantially and it needs to prepare for this level of bleeding. So starting in the third trimester, the levels will begin to increase anticipating the delivery of the baby and trying to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. This does occur whether you have von Willebrand or not. So in um, regular pregnancies as well, you will see an increase in von Willebrand factor. And typically this is in levels that most people are not familiar with in von Willebrand. We are talking about 200% to 250%. You're starting to get into those upper ranges. So these are not um, just trying to get to the, the 50 that we sometimes get you know, cemented into our mind. These are into the 200, 250 50% from baselines that are 80 and 117. So this is definitely an increase that is needed. So as we have tracked individually normalized changes in von Willebrand, as you can see, pre and then first trimester, second trimester, you start to get a rise. And then about in that third, third trimester, you really get the biggest increase, but then you decrease pretty substantially right after delivery, and therefore you can have a risk for postpartum hemorrhage within that six weeks after delivery, and it just, it bottoms out to baseline very, very quickly. So we did look at normal and von Willebrand subjects, so patients without von Willebrand disease and patients with von Willebrand disease, and looked at their late pregnancy and postpartum laboratory changes. And what you can see from these examples is that patients who were treated standard by von Willebrand, as well as those were, who were untreated, had almost kind of these expected results. So what we find from these is that even patients who were receiving treatment for their von Willebrand during delivery still went on, had subsequent postpartum hemorrhage. And so perhaps the levels that we are treating at as providers are not sufficiently high enough to get to where we need to be if we can't get to a regular um, level of expectation in a patient with that von Willebrand. We also see this in their PBAC and estimated blood loss. Those patients who were treated and untreated still did not rise to the level of a patient without von Willebrand or the quote unquote normal reference. And so this really tells us that our treatment is still insufficient in this regard to ensure that these patients are not moving on to postpartum hemorrhage within the uh, postpartum and up to six weeks afterwards. So late pregnancy delivery and postpartum in labor, von Willebrand and factor eight generally increase to its maximum height. Of course, mom is stressed, baby is stressed, everyone is stressed, so the levels are the highest. It does increase in less than healthy pregnancies, so regardless of uh, where they are, it still increases. And some type one and many type two patients actually will fail to increase into the normal range. So while we do expect many patients to actually rise into this 100, 150%, sometimes even 200% range, not all patients with von Willebrand will respond with any kind of correction. And it's just potentially their genetics are unable to create anything more additional and they may never increase. And so some patients may enter pregnancy at lower levels of von Willebrand. And those women who are treated, um, they're still not getting to those same levels. After delivery, of course, we see a very low von Willebrand and a very low factor eight. It has been consumed and everything drops down. Von Willebrand treated women appear untreated. So as I explained earlier, unfortunately, even when we are treating pregnant patients, uh, we may not be hitting targets. And some of that is just due to us now learning about this. And sometimes we had an idea in our minds that you know 200% perhaps would be too high, 100, 150 would be too high. And so oftentimes treaters would usually generally sit in the 80s to 100s, and that may not be sufficient for pregnancy, delivery, and postpartum. So this is the primary setup and design of the study. It include all women of history of von Willebrand. We did include type one with less than 30% RCO, one and two and type three. 
And the primary objective was the rate of primary postpartum hemorrhage. The secondary objectives were the rate of secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So some of these later um, postpartum hemorrhages that were happening uh, later down on the road, you know, week, two weeks later, up to six weeks later, they were separated into whether or not they corrected based on a risk to seeing cofactor greater than 100% or less than 100% considered as a non-corrector. And the correctors were observed and given tranexamic acid at cord clamping so that they did receive antifibrinolytic therapy, but they were just observed under antifibrinolytic antifibrinolytic therapy in the corrector group. In the non-corrector group, they were given Willate and increased their von Willer brand to between 100 to 150%. And uh, they were also given tranexamic acid at cord clamping as well. Then their therapy is continued for postpartum five to seven days of vaginal delivery and seven to 10 days if it's a C-section. And they are continued on tranexamic acid to postpartum day 14. And um, patients can also opt to receive their von Willebrand factor genotype as part of the study. So where we explored, we have mapped many of the mutations in hemophilia A. We are very far behind in mapping the mutations that result in von Willebrand, as well as there are other aspects beyond genetics that can result in issues with von Willebrand. So this is, like I said, these are the beginning stages of really understanding what these individual mutations are doing to phenotypic presentation of how patients are experiencing their mutations. So this will help us understand that as part of the study. The structure is 110 patients over 15 sites and up to four years. Um, if I believe right, we look at closing the study or ending enrollment in quarter two of 2023. So most of the data should be available by that time. It is central IRB approved and the first patients now have been, um, we have some of the data for about two years currently. And I wanna open it up to any questions. Again, I know it's a lot of information in a short period of time. Wow, thanks, Amber. Um, yeah, well, again, I have questions. First of all, something that struck me, um, I know that von Willebrand's factor affects factor eight, and uh, I, I, am I correct in saying that? I, I'm certainly not a medical provider. Yeah, no, and it does get confusing um, because they are so partnered together because von Willebrand protects and carries uh, factor eight, the two and two go hand in hand. So it can be confusing for someone who has a lower factor eight because their von Willebrand is low. It's not that they also have hemophilia A, although there are combinations. And that's why genetic testing really helps in those situations determining if they have two conditions or one condition. But it's usually a one-to-one -one ratio between factor eight and von Willebrand because von Willebrand is protecting that factor eight. Okay. So where I was initially going with that is um, you, you hear about, especially with our sons, waking up with a bleed. Like, what the heck did you do in your sleep that gave you a bleed? It sounds like this could be some, some of the reason why. Right. And so that does tend back to the time of day. And so some of that diurnal variation that they may see is that their body may decide while they are sleeping. That is when they are calmest. I used to joke that I wish I could take a, a sample from someone when they're sleeping because that's when you're going to get the most accurate results but obviously that's not very easy to do um, but that's possibly one of the reasons is that their levels have dropped sufficiently and whatever repair is going on kind of slows down and is not enough and so sometimes you can see that at that time. And the reason why it would be important to get that lower level is so that you can access treatment is that correct? Well, the lower level does help kind of understand where the lowest you may be at any given point in time. Von Willebrand is very difficult because there are so many variations into when you are tested, when time you are tested. The newer testing that we have available um, through many of the new labs, um, GP1B binding and things, those are much more accurate and representative than say something like first to see in cofactor. But I think what is more important is being able to document those bleeding episodes and how severe they are, because sometimes they do not correlate with the numbers. And it's important to understand what is going on. And as we see with the VIP study in patients who are expected to have no issue at quote unquote normal, normal numbers, we just don't understand what is the reference range for a delivery for someone with and without a bleeding disorder? What is the reference range 
for aging individuals. Much of the reference ranges we have in hematology were built on individuals, young, healthy, 20, 30s, college age, where labs across the country made reference ranges based on that. And so sometimes we, we just need to expand and see perhaps the reference range for someone undergoing a bleed is different than what is normally required just to be sitting here. Okay, we've got some stuff um, in the chat here. Randy says, I noticed the use of the Wilcoxon rank in the statistics, which you use when you have a small sample size. What was the N in this study? So our N is not quite completed, but because of the N, because of the number that we have, and it was with all of these studies, we don't expect to have, you know, something where we could do ANOVA style statistics. And so Currently, we're hoping for 110, but I don't know that we're going to reach that. But if we don't reach that, even if we get numbers that are less than that in the 30 to 60 person range, it should still give us an idea of what we're looking at and comparing um, both sides. Is that helpful, Randy? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is a small population. And you're looking at a really, really small piece of that small population. So getting it in a hundred is hard. So I just want to know how, how small it was. That just, you know, just cause I'm kind of a statistics geek. So I just want to know if you're, you know, if you're working with like two dozen or you're up to around 60. Right, we, we want to be at 110 by completion, which we have about a year and a half. But the reality is I think at the last one, we may have been at 60. Five. That ain't um, bad. That ain't bad. So, so just kind of in that range, you just don't want to set yourself up for something you can't do a statistical analysis on once you find out you only got 10 people. Well, and the problem is the people, there's some people out there that don't, don't think that way. They get a sample size of four and run it and say, oh, hey, this is, this is the word. It's like, okay. But anyway, though, 60s, 60s, uh, very respectable ish, 60 ish. Randy, right. you want to ask your other question? Oh, sorry, Amber, go ahead. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just also going to explain that this will also be further separated into correctors and non-correctors. So that'll probably be the top on each side. Which which makes it even harder to separate the statistics out, right? You take you take your small sample size, you cut it in half, and then you're in, in deeper right. water. Uh, right. So so you talked about these new labs with, with better uh, 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 diagnostic capability. I mean, I used to work in a I used to do risk deceit and cofactor. I've worked in those labs um, and they're rare. Uh, even ones that can even do a decent von Willebrand test are rare. So these new labs, how many are there? Like 10, five, where are they? Um, the ones that I used to work with and have the most experience with um, is Versity out of Wisconsin, um, Bloodworks as well. But many of the labs are also moving into getting GP1B activity. So many of the lab core and Quest can now do this. Really? It's contingent upon um, proper sampling. Um, so a lot of, you have to make sure that the person isn't doing a traumatic stick and they're in no hemolysis whatsoever in that mm -hmm. plasma sample. But yes, LabCorp and Quest now have access. And what LabCorp and Quest may not tell you always is that if they cannot do it themselves is that they can send out to places such as um, blood centers as what's called a pass through. So those are those are options to get to these GP1B binding. And what that looks at is different. So where risk to Seton cofactor kind of, we used it indirectly because we thought, you know, hey, this antibiotic would work great for the population. Turns out it's really bad, but we can use it for this capacity. This actually shows what your binding is between the platelet and the von Willebrand molecule and how that combines. So it's a little bit more specific. So if you if you're using these send out labs, how how um, delicate is the is the sample? I mean, is they have to have it on ice. I mean, can it get messed up during oh, this sure. journey across the country? For sure. If you have a, a good policy where you are using um, flash freezing or negative 70 storage, and then you're doing dry ice and you're ensuring that it's getting there within the appropriate time frames, you can be relatively assured that it has not thawed. And that's the biggest problem is if it thaws because you lose the activity. And uh, we sent out many successful in my prior life um, you know, shipping them out in 113 degree weather in Las Vegas, we were able to overcome that by ensuring that the the, the processing, shipping, and the frozen aspects. Of the world. All right. Well, good luck. <laughs> There's a lot of um, comments in the chat from women who are the reason why we are here. 
Um, Carolyn made a comment that she says this information explains uh, why I had such severe postpartum hemorrhage with both sons, um, guessing that they were either not correcting or correcting inadequately. Um, and then Mel, um, Mel, I don't know if you want to share. Are, can you come off of mute? Yeah, hi. I just won't show you my face because I'm sick. <laughs> oh, well, we're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. So you yeah. had a really interesting comment. I thought it'd be nice to hear you say it. Yeah, so I had two C-sections with my kids. First one was an emergency C-section. The second one was a planned C-section. And after both cesareans, the doctors, which were, they were totally different doctors for each. Uh, they were kind of surprised by my level of bleeding. I was bleeding from my incision. I was bleeding from, you know, what I was, it was just, they were very surprised. There was also some odd bruising and they just didn't understand what was going on. Uh, it took forever to heal internally. Um, and yeah, at six week checkups, I was still bleeding way more than I should have been. And, and it was just kind of weird. So, um, you know, the more I've learned about this, cause I didn't learn about the diagnosis of, of what I had until my kiddo was two for my youngest. So it was several years before I learned about any of this. And before I was told I had a Von Wildebrand. Um, and it just, I, I don't really know what to say at this point. Um, <laughs> basically it was just really interesting that you know, it, it, they could have just, if someone had just had any inkling of, you know, VWD or anything, they could have tested me and, and probably resolved the issue. And I probably would have not been anemic and all that afterward. Cause I just want to stop bleeding. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're, you're getting some echoes, uh, in the chat and then Carolyn has her hand raised. I bet that's probably what she wants to mention. Go ahead, Carolyn. Thank you. Yeah, this, this is so great that we're here doing this because when when you're hemorrhaging, you can't be your own advocate. And we didn't have advocates. And <clears throat> sorry, my my video is not working. But yeah, I had hemorrhages the size of grapefruits, and I was in shock after both births. And I told my mom, well, she said, Oh, that's normal because she had <laughs> she. She um, unfortunately didn't survive von Willebrands, and then and then not only your you know pars, postpartum depression, but um, with anemia, it uh, causes severe uh, depression among other things. So um, it's time and 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 like um, the woman who just spoke in, in times like uh, my boys were both diagnosed because of their nosebleeds where even though I kept looking and looking and looking for help, I wasn't able to get support. So it wasn't through till my boys, we were all tested at Stanford because of my son's nosebleeds, but not because of my own. So I'm really appreciative of Amber and everyone being here because we have to stop this cycle of this um, women just not getting the, the appropriate um, help. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, yeah, that's why we're all here. And, um, Priscilla mentioned that, um, she hopes everybody was able to see the study that she participated in, in 1971 with women with low factor H that was 50 years ago, people. We, we, this is not brand new information although it sometimes feel like it is. Um, I, I don't know. I, I want to ask if anybody else has any other questions or comments or thoughts. Uh, the floor is open. I just wanted to echo what um, Dawn said in terms of data and information. If we don't have, and we heard it a little bit in terms of even within this study, we may be dealing with lower numbers than we would hope. And one of the ways that we can do that that is to get the word out in terms of participating in, in registries and some of the other things that uh, the, co the consumer-based organizations are doing, HFA and HF, in terms of registry data. And some of this is more in-depth than it used to be. So it used to just be, I think, some women have this expectation that it's from UDC, and UDC was a little bit 
older and the information that it looked at was a little bit different than what women may need now today. And so some of the redesigns of some of these surveys and things are trying to get to the core of how people are experiencing their bleeding disorder. And if we can understand how people are experiencing it, then we can advance the science on the other side to correlate and collaborate to say if women you know, as providers, sometimes their expectation previously was that we just needed to give somebody a dose of relate before they delivered and there was nothing afterwards. And as we evolved in understanding treatment now, we know that patients need things afterwards, but we're still moving to how long afterwards? Are we talking about 10 days? And the idea of treating someone for 10 days is, is a lot longer than it used to be. And so the only way we can do that though is to have participation and then get everyone involved in collaborating and aggregating all this data and information together. Yeah, there are two different variations of data that we're dealing with here. That's what I'll call event data. What happens to the patient describing the situation? And then there's the scientific data, the mutations that are a longer term look at things. We have to work on both of them. We need to aggregate the data and it crosses over, as you mentioned, with, with, with what do you treat at, after, before, et cetera. They actually cross over, but we need to separate the two types of data, build them both. There's some great comments in the chat. Um, something that keeps coming up over and over is this idea of the carrier status and the fact that perhaps carriers don't actually have bleeding symptoms. And I'm um, unfortunately, uh, we have a uh, perfect story to illustrate that for our next meeting, there is a, um, a young woman that was told that uh, uh, there is hemophilia in her family. However, she is not a carrier. She was tested. I'm not sure how they did that test or what happened to it. Um, but uh, unfortunately, her son almost died because they were sure that there was no hemophilia to be passed down. And this just happened recently. And I'm happy to say that the child is alive. Um, but there is a uh, tremendous, t uh, um, I don't even know what the word is. Like we have to pay attention to this. We can't just go, oh, that's a one-off. That's a one-off. These one-offs are coming to us daily. They're not one-offs. This is the norm. This is what's happening with women in our community. And I am so, um, yeah, there needs to be more accountability. Yep. So uh, I, I, I'm hoping that that's what we're all working towards accountability, more um, research, uh, the ability for women to take this information to their treater and say, you may not be aware of it. However, it exists and I would like to access it since it is scientific. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to go over, but <laughs> I um, encourage people to advocate for themselves. Does anybody else have any other thoughts, questions? Something you're mad about having to do with this topic? I have a question, Ashley. Is it still, you know, when I was going through menopause and I was trying to find a hematologist locally and I hemorrhaged for eight weeks straight, they said that most of them were too busy with oncology. Is that still a problem? Amber, you want to speak to that? So access um, has been something that has been on the radar for some time. I know that there are emerging models of care that are coming out. Um, some of the issues have come across not understanding how some of these levels impact and what the implications can be. And so some of this research can help with that, but there are um, resources and things that I think can identify a pathway forward to obtain care that may have not been available in the past. And I'm sure that um, Ashley will be able to communicate that out to the foundation of all of the different ways that accessible care has changed. I would say it has improved in the last 10 years when I uh, first came into bleeding disorders. Um, we kept our women in our comprehensive clinic, and it's only now in these last couple years that I've heard now others are doing the same. Um, so that's those are that's progress. I know it happened at a very slower pace than many of us um, maybe would have liked to have seen for sure. And um, and some of us that are you know mothers of children, I am hoping that my my son, if he has a daughter, by that time frame, those things will have changed immensely in terms of access to care because it is always a concern. But I do feel that access and the models that have gone with it have advanced 
sufficiently enough in these last few years that there is now access where there was not before, with the caveat that perhaps not everyone, especially rural areas and things, is sometimes still a struggle to get uh, access. Um, let's see. We've got a lot going on in the chat. Um, Marianne says, to Randy's point, I worked in a lab. My HTC said not to send testing to labs, such as Quest, because of handling. Go to a center that does the testing on site. I've heard that too. Um, and then um, Sosin, who was one of the first speakers that we had, says there's days where I'm still upset about the lack of accountability that's going on and writing women off is just complaining about aging, the pains and the aches. But in reality, we have bleeding. We have a bleeding disorder that's been undiagnosed for way too long and our bodies are just tired of being ignored. I love that. Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself, Mel. Thank you. Hey, just wanted to ask permission just because. Um, anyway, so I was reporting my daughter's bleeds to the HTC regularly because I was trying to help add to her file to build a case to try to help them understand why I wanted to have a little more than just two doses on hand, stuff like that. And I have access to her medical records that I check on a monthly basis and they weren't logging anything that I reported to them ever. And I would even call and say, please log this. I would like this in her file. So I'm wondering if there, is there a way that I could approach this differently where they might understand, you know, why I want it and how I could be respectful with my approach so that maybe they'll take me more seriously and start logging those for me. It may be helpful. Um, I know with many of the electronic health record systems that are available, whether it's Epic, uh, Cerner, Allscripts, um, many of them, it's not always what goes pushes through to the patient portal is what is accessible on the other side. So sometimes there is a template that is resulted out to the patient that is inclusive of perhaps lab results or um, communication back and forth, but it doesn't communicate everything that is in the chart. So one of the ways I could uh, recommend perhaps approaching it is to go back to the practice and ask them if they could include that as a pushover to you just so you know that they are receiving it. And then in other ways as well, um, participating in much of the registries and things so that that information gets to a national level because when we can get it at a national level and get more of the guidance and science follows with it, we can take a look at this and say, these this is what's occurring. Because unfortunately, if it's only reported at the local level, we may not catch sight of it at a national level and the, therefore the science may not follow it. So I would start with perhaps the, um, the clinic itself and just ask them, hey, what crosses over in these systems? I would just like to make sure that these things are coming over so that I can track them as well on my side and I can show them to other providers that I see that this is what's going on and these are my communications with you. I think that's very helpful in my experience between gynecologists and hematologists, understanding those unique roles as to what's going on on each side. So kind of approach it from a more collaborative aspect of, hey, I need to be able to have them see this in my record when I'm talking to other clinicians. I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Dr. Amber. Priscilla, you're next. I just want to ask a question. I have heard that it is difficult to get hematologists to work at hemophilia treatment centers. Is that the truth? So a lot of the data that we have seen in the last decade or so is that there are very few residency positions within the U.S. that ultimately are at facilities that are coagulation centers. So, for example, there's about eight that are specifically coagulation, what we call fellowships. So as a physician progresses through their training, they go through residency and then they move on and they graduate from medical school and they go on to a fellowship. This fellowship is usually at an institution that can manage both oncology and hematology. However, the funding can be different depending on what the institutions are receiving it on either side for. So unfortunately, those who have a interest in it may not be in a fellowship that is coagulation specific. And unfortunately, the oncology portions of those curriculums 
can sometimes kind of overlap and unfortunately overcome some of the coagulation. There is work, I know, I believe NHF has been working on um, some sustainability things on the back end to ensure that these fellowships and ASH is working towards that as well, that these fellowships remain more in a coagulation aspect in the benign side, as opposed to what they call the malignant or oncology side, because there is definitely a shortage of adult providers, especially adult providers within hematology, and then even fewer that go and remain in what we call benign hematology on the coagulation side. So unfortunately, yes, there is a documented shortage of providers in the hematology space. Real quick, I'd like to jump in here. One of the problems, as Amber knows, is there's no money in hemophilia. The money's in the money's in oncology, and and a lot, there's very it's really hard for most of these doctors to make a living being hemophilia doctors, unless you're at a huge huge center. So that's that's the other problem, and I don't know how we're going to fix that. Um. <clears throat> Uh, somebody's named Mary. Is it Marianne or Mary that's trying to ask a question or call in? Um, it's Marianne May. Oh, it, it is. Okay. So I know that she had a point of information being in menopause for many years. My levels have gone from 50% to 35% in a year. Test often. If you need a surgery, your insurance company will look at levels and decide if you get factor or treatment. Wow. And, and Don, your point is um, so smart to echo what Amber said about just having that cross-referencing. I think we could all, um, even the guys could learn um, about that as well if they're being questioned. Um, I had a call last week, my last call of the week. I'm telling you there's no shortage and then we'll end. Uh, a young man, uh, mild hemophilia A, doesn't go to a treatment center. Um, probably has never infused and was having a dental procedure and the dentist stopped um, mid procedure and said, you have hemophilia, I can't finish this. So this young man went to his hematologist and they told him, we can't help you. We, we don't know how to deal with that. So um, I am referring him to the treatment center that he literally lives like five miles away from and has never been to. Um, you know, our, our, our young men are falling through the cracks too. So we don't want to forget about them. I want to thank everybody for being here. If you have any interest in joining any of those working groups that I talked about, go ahead and send me an email, ashley.gregory at hemofoundation.org. And um, I, I want to thank everybody who's already doing work in this field and um, advocating on the behalf of women and our family members who um, will be super excited to be able to share in the care <laughs> that other people are receiving. So um, Amber, Dr. Amber Federizzo from Octopharma, our clinical nurse educator, thank you so much for providing us with this information and thank you everybody for attending. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.